Um, so Chris, if you're ready, we can get things started. Somebody want to go on mute if they were having a little conversation. Um, so good morning, everybody, or afternoon, evening, whatever it is in your galactic time zone. Um, so first up, we have action item review, as usual. Um, have an update from Dan on the virtual hackathon, and I don't know if Sheehan or Ben is on. Maybe they could update us on how the fabric has been going. I'd uh, appreciate somebody weighing in on that. Um, and uh, we can have maybe a brief discussion on what we can do to tune it up or tune it down or whatever. Um, uh, then next up we have Greg Haskins. Uh, he's got a proposal for a chain tool. Um, and uh, and then we have work group updates. Unless there is any other discussion topics, we can get going. And I apologize in advance, but I'm going to have to leave at 11. I've got a customer visit, so the call can keep going, but I'll have to leave. All right, let's go. So exit criteria. Um, Arno, did we make any progress over the course of the past few days? I apologize, but I've been traveling. Oh. Not really, but I was hoping if Jeremy is on, uh, there's like a side discussion, and Jeremy added the whole table in the document, and uh, he, you know, he seems to be interested in going further than what we were talking about, which was pre specifically the exit criteria to go from incubation to maturation, and so, you know, he, he apologized, said he couldn't attend the call last week when he discussed it. So I was hoping maybe if he's here today, we could have a bit of discussion on that to see how that fits. I, you know, I don't want to disregard what he's done. He actually put a, a, quite a bit of content to the document. And at the same time, I don't really know how to use it. So. Yeah, so I, I see Jeremy on. Jeremy. Um... So, so maybe it's a good and I, and I did send. I now I remember that I actually sent a note to the list about um, some of my thoughts around this. Um, I think it'd be valuable to sort of uh, to to have a brief discussion of this. Maybe if we could um, before we do, if we can just sort of go through the um, the remaining action items, and then we can visit this right before we talk about the hackathon. That's fine with me. Okay. So that works. Todd. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, Todd, uh, ha uh, hackathons and the, the scheduling, how, how's that coming? Yep, um, so quick update. Uh, the June hackathon is underway. We'll do a quick update on that later this after, or later in this call. Uh, for July, there are essentially two options. Um, we reached out to a variety of companies. Uh, so Chris, as you know, IBM uh, offered up some space. Uh, that week of July 25th. Uh, the one downside of that is, and Chris, maybe you can speak to this as well, is it's a bit south of San Jose. Um, not, <laughs> a lot south of San Jose. <laughs> yeah, not, not near a whole lot in that area. So um, yeah. that, that, there, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so that's not necessarily ideal. And then for those traveling in uh, to SFO, it's, it's a bit of a trek to get down there. Um, the other option would be to uh, use some space in San Francisco adjacent to where the Linux Foundation office is and the Presidio. Uh, there would be a cost associated with that. The one thing we're trying to figure out, there's essentially three different options. Uh, only one is confirmed availability at this point. We should know back uh, from the others uh, this afternoon and, and can send the, the final date pattern for that. Um, but we would, on the high end, be looking at spending around $12,000 to hold the HackFest, on the low end, around $6,000. Um, our, our preferred option would put us uh, right around $9,000 uh, to hold that event. The board has allocated uh, $85,000 over the course of the year to fund some of these hackathons in the instance where we're not able to have a member host them. So those funds do mm -hmm. exist. We would just need the TSC to okay that. Um, so I think for the purpose of this discussion, um, you know, there's two things we need to decide, uh, is the preference towards, you know, using the IBM location or using the San Francisco location, uh, and then from there go into the, the sub decision of, um, what the preference is. Right. right. Um, so just, 
Yeah. Just to follow up, Todd, on, on the, yeah, so so the, the offer from IBM, we looked at a couple of different places. Foster City is obviously closer to San Francisco, um, but we only had um, – the only, the only the only space that would fit everybody was really auditorium seating, and I don't think we want to do a hackathon in that kind of a setting, frankly. Um, and so, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, so we didn't have a, a, a large enough space for the sixty people in Foster City, um, and that leaves us with Silicon Valley, which is our Santa Teresa lab, former, formerly known as the Santa Teresa lab. It's um, in it's a very southern border of San Jose, so it basically borders on um, um, what's the town just below it there? Um, Morgan Hill or Gilroy, something like that. Practically Gilroy. <laughs> it's practically in Gilroy. Um, uh, so it's 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 rather you know out of the way. It's not. I mean, it, it's 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 a good twenty minutes to San Jose Center. So there's not a whole lot there, right? I mean, there's some. Plants and some vegetables and deep and a lot stuff. Of dry land. Yeah, a lot of dry land. <laughs> so, um, so, so I, again, it's it's a nice place inside, but there's like I said, if you want to go out for dinner, there's not a whole lot of choices and, and stuff. Um, uh, so, you know, I mean, I don't want to discourage people, but I also feel, you know, Todd, to your point, it it it's also a good hour from San Francisco uh, airport, so. Um, if you can't get into San Jose Airport, it can be a bit of a hike. So I, I mean, maybe we should just sort of get a sense from, and, and again, this doesn't have to be a TSC vote. This is just the sense is, is anybody sort of violently opposed to staying in uh, South San Jose area there um, for a few days? Uh, in which case, that can help Todd and and company focus on uh, the Presidio options. Just one more piece of information. There is one advantage is that it's reverse commute to go there. So that is true. While, that is true. You're, you're not going to be stuck in traffic too much. That's right. That's right. While going to the Presidio, you know, is, is another story. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> So I, I, am I hearing that there's nobody violently opposed to that, and they can leave it on the list, or? I certainly wouldn't would mind that. I'm sorry, Mick. I, I, sorry, I was just saying I, I wouldn't mind going south at all. Okay, okay. Any others? Okay. We'll talk Let's leave it on the list for now, but let's work up the Presidio and, and the other the other couple of options from this afternoon, and just sort of we'll weigh the... All right, sounds good. Minus. Sounds good. Uh, just quickly moving on from there, August, we'll look to do a virtual hackathon. I dropped a doodle poll into the minute uh, into the agenda. I'll send it out with the minutes as well, just so we can firm up a timeline for getting folks together virtually in August. And then for September, October... Uh, it sounded like the group was really interested in doing a European hackathon. Um, there are a couple options to co-locate with events, uh, but we did connect with ABN AMRO, who has offered to host this. It would be at their office in Amsterdam. Um, they're also very keen to pull together uh, some of the community around there. Um, IBM Netherlands is very interested to participate, the uh, fintech community in Holland. Uh, blockchain initiative of the Dutch government, uh, various universities, and they also have a pretty good network of uh, blockchain contributors in Amsterdam. So that definitely seems like uh, a great option um, to pull that together. They said dates are fairly flexible in terms of when they would be able to do that. So I included a doodle poll to gauge general interest and time timing from everyone. Uh, definitely take a second to complete your availability if that's something you're interested in participating in. And that, that wraps it up for hackathons. Chris, do you want me to move on to the um, Cybos question before executing? Yes, 
All right. Uh, so Cybos, as many know, will be in Geneva September 26th to 29th. The Hyperledger Project Marketing Committee is planning to sponsor that event and have an exhibit booth there uh, for some marketing efforts. So as part of that, you know, given that this is a significant marketing opportunity, uh, the marketing committee is creating a SWAT team basically consisting of events, marketing, PR, and they also want to incorporate a couple people from the technical community. So they're looking for a few volunteers um, uh, just to provide the technical perspective from this. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, shoot me a message uh, and I'll get you connected up with that team uh, as they form a small group working on that. All right. Thanks, Todd. Okay, so let's talk briefly about the um, the exit criteria. So, um, you know, as our no, you know, our no, we, we had, or, and everybody who was on the call last week uh, recalls uh, some of the discussion, and so Arno was collecting and um, editing the uh, the document according to seventy four percent of the world's global ACH volume. Sounds like everybody's watching TV. Or? Well past that tipping point. Or maybe like another very person interesting on the call. show. Okay. Um, so, 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 Jeremy, um, maybe you could provide us with some uh, some background on on the thinking uh, on uh, the, the the content that you had added to the exit criteria document. Certainly, Chris. Thanks. Um, in Trying to look through and uh, make sense of a lot of the different comments that have that came up, uh, both sort of uh, on the some of the uh, Slack channels as well as uh, within the document itself. It looked like there were different threads going on, um, and in trying to make sense of that, uh, I tried. I started working through. A, Trying to st uh, structure something, and what it's what it seemed like kept coming up were a couple different things. Um, one of them was that the, uh, for example, the the idea of the of the word maturity seemed to set people off in terms of thinking about the qual the sort of the qualities of the software as a, not just as uh, sort of the nature of the, the project around it. Um, and the other thing that kept coming up was a lot of things that could be requirements, they could be thing that, things that you attest to about the software. Um, and when I looked at that and I also looked at um, some of the other materials that uh, I think Todd and others had written up, about the project life cycle, it's, it seemed like a few things could be teased out. And so what I tried to do was tease out different, different things about what are we saying about different life stages in the project life cycle versus what are some of the uh, things, were, things that are being described within those. And so the table just came out of trying to make sense of that because it, it seemed as though what was going part of what was going on in the discussion was about the need for a change control process. So not necessarily a definition of done, but that there that um, it was probably a good idea that a project had a definition of done, um, and then there there's some of the um, some of the other sort of criteria about projects seem to fall into sort of adoption, um, community support levels, um, in it, in addition to just what the software itself did, or ways you could judge it, whether it's a question of judging it as being done, ready for release, and so I just tried to tease those things that, things out. Not to say that there is a definition of done, for example, that should be promulgated, but that a project should have some concept of done and, and stick to it 
within a change control process. Because I think some of the things that um, would, might give people pause would be, for example, if all, the, all of a sudden uh, part of the project went the way TrueCrypt went, where a lot of people depend on it for some very sensitive uh, and valuable materials, and then all of a sudden the project shuts down. So essentially in trying to step back and look at sort of how this fits in so I could better understand it and, and ramp up on understanding how, the, how this is structured, not having worked on a uh, formal open source project before. Um, that's what I sort of tried to lay out in this table on page three of the draft. And I think it, it, as, an ex as an example, you know, whether or not it's the TSC who says something's done or it's the project team that says something done, presumably somebody ought to be saying this thing is done, it's done based on the fact that it's somebody's written, you know, it's, there's some piece of documentation that's written it up. It's documentation looks at functional, technical, you know, abilities like scalability, operate, you know, service level agreements. It's been some way, in some way tested, it's in some way been uh, validated or code reviewed, it's similar to sort of some of the discussions around Garrett. Um, and then at some point, at some point, if that stops, somebody ought to flag that. Um, not because, you know, with um, I guess with, with something like Hyperledger, there's so much hype that's driving a lot of enthusiastic folks to the table, which is great. And presumably, the goal is to sort of uh, uh, channel that productively. And so I don't th think there's a need. Uh, I assume it's important to stay away from a need to really uh, push a lot of formal process on. But if, 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 if part of the exit criteria is just to provide some guidelines, um, providing them with a little structure like saying, you probably want to have some kind of documentation. You probably want to have some kind of definition of done. You probably want to have some kind of release, not just release process, but change control process, which is, which are pretty close to the same thing, but not exactly. Um, and that if, if a, for example, a project stops following that, at some point somebody ought to flag it. Um, just because if 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 this effort does succeed, which would which is great, um, we just would want, want to make sure people's expectations are out there are being managed. And I think part of that, for example, is um, we were having a discussion yesterday on the identity working group. Um, one of the one of the concern uh, questions was would it would it make sense to be able to even within whatever we're defining as a, um, a project that's exited incubation, if there's a say a section a section of it that's experimental versus a section of it that's ready for release versus a section of it that's production ready. That would be a valuable distinction, at least in terms of setting expectations for folks who might be either working on it or using it. So that was basically the idea here was to sort of work, uh, work th think through what are some potential uh, dimensions of the guidelines that have come up and use this table as a way to try and slot those into some sort of structure. But that's that's the idea anyways. And uh, Chris, Chris Allen uh, had suggested some further follow-up on that as well. Does that, does that make sense? <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, it does. I think, um, you know, and again, some of this is, uh, I think, a function of, you know, sort of the traditional, if you will, I don't know if it was traditional, but, you know, sort of uh, MO for an open source projects. And, you know, you have many communities such as Apache and Eclipse uh, and Linux Foundation that have <clears throat> leveraged this concept of incubation to be really 
and, and, I, and I think that this somehow or other is, 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 is where you're, you're heading with this, but is that effectively it's a measure of whether or not the team that's producing the code is mature, right? Have we got, you know, um, uh, a diverse community of developers so there's not just one person or one uh, company that's, that's contributing, um, but that it's, there's a certain diversity because the, that helps with the sustainability of the project if you have multiple committers from different, um, uh, you know, different companies or different, you know, uh, whatever. And um, and then you know whether to to your point, are they following sort of the prescribed uh, processes for doing um, the code, uh, for doing reviews, for um, uh, you know for for being able to produce a release, um, and but the exit criteria for I mean I was just looking this morning at the. Apache and and the uh, you know uh, criteria and and it's basically fairly straightforward. It basically says you know that uh, the code runs. <laughs> that it doesn't say that it's done. It just says that it's it's running code. That you know they are following the the sort of uh, and, and again Apache has fairly um, uh, you know fairly conservative approach to managing. Um, uh, intellectual property, and so that's a, a function of the maturity of the project is whether or not they've got, the, you know, they've they've leveraged all the various tools and and they're able to get through a release process. I think maybe even a couple of them, um, you know, cleanly, you know, with the uh, with the IP audit and so forth, and then um, uh, and then you know again the diversity of the community and so forth. It, and that, that's really about all they measure, right? It's not a function of, is this code ready for production or something like that. Now, that said, I think that, you know, again, and again, I think that if we're going to have, uh, if the Hyperledger project is going to be host to a number of top-level projects, that I don't know that we necessarily want the TSC to be deciding everything for every project. I think that realistically, you know, we're going to have to, in order to make the scale, we have to sort of leave it up to the project team to decide when they think something is done um, for, from a release perspective, you know, is this a long-term release and does it meet a lot of the criteria we're looking for? So we may have, you know, we may want to put together some sort of a, a release yardstick uh, in terms of maturity and code coverage, uh, test coverage and, um, you know, long-term support, you know, branch maintenance process and so forth for something that we're going to consider to be ready for prime time. But the exit from incubation itself shouldn't necessarily be predicated on whether or not the code is production ready and sort of done, right? Because again, again we're never really going to be done. And that, that was sort of the, the, the spirit of what I wrote in, in, in my note to the, to the, to the mailing list, but I didn't see any, any response to that. I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts on this. Um, hey, Chris, this is Hart. Yeah, I talked with uh, Jeremy and Chris Allen yesterday about a lot of this stuff, um, and I think a lot of people are just worried that uh, people, particularly outsiders, will uh maturation with like a product ready to release uh, and be used, and people were worried that uh, someone might use the product, you know, someone might use Hyperledger before it's ready, uh, and maybe, you know, it, it could be the case that there, you know, there's security flaws, a catastrophe happens, money is lost, or something like that, uh, and people are just worried about something like that. So I think if we, uh, if we discussed, you know, probably sort of like some kind of release criteria, uh, then people would be a lot more comfortable with this. Or if we said something like, "Okay, well, this is mature, but you know, we're we're clearly not ready for release," or so, or something like that. Does that make sense? This is Brian Bellendorf. I don't know if you guys can hear me. I've been uh, um, yep. muted. Okay, good. Uh, the problem must have been on my side. Uh, some of this conversation was my cue to jump in. <laughs> um, I think 
uh, a lot of these observations are really uh, insightful, and, and, I, and I would love us to borrow and steal as much as we can from the Apache incubation process as we can, because I think, you know, that's something that's been honed over 15 years uh, uh, and has resulted in uh, some, some really good community dynamics I'd love to try to replicate. And, I've, and I would love to separate out um, at least two things. There might be even a third thing in there, the maturity and ongoing health of the community. And that is by having this uh, exit criteria from incubation that says you have to be able to put out a release as a community. That release has to represent the efforts of uh, uh, different organizations and individuals, right? It can't just be, you know, uh, one company that's done the most of it or, or all of it. Um, and so some, it, that's kind of a squirrely definition. It's been a challenge in some projects as they're bootstrapping, um, but uh, it's one of those you kind of know when you see it thing. Um, and that that uh, uh, that should be one one criteria. And then there's an ongoing reporting process from that project. In Apache's case, it's up to the board. Uh, in our case, uh, I think we should have it be reporting up to a board that represents kind of the technical interests in the project. Uh, and in this case, I would say that's probably what the new role for the TSC is, um, or or the existing role. Um, and it's the idea is that it reports these projects at Apache. They report once a quarter. We could probably start with monthly reports on um, you know their activity. You know the releases they've made, the new contributors that have joined. Um, the, uh, um, you know, it's to some degree, code quality, how many bugs might be outstanding or that sort of thing. But it's not just metrics. It's a, it's a narrative report. And one of the most important things is being able to respond to security notices um, and push releases quickly. Uh, that's a really good measure of the health of a community is when a security hole came in, were they able to address it and respond within, you know, hours and days rather than weeks or, or not at all. Um, so then separately, um, there is the question of code maturity and the labeling. And what I'd love to see across the projects within Hyperledger is a consistent kind of naming protocol for code that is, you know, we should come up with a taxonomy, but say developer preview, alpha, beta, and production, right? Um, uh, and we could correlate those with numbering with a numbering scheme of some sort, but but having a consistent label like that across our projects would help trans you know, communicate to the rest of the world, you know, where the projects are, but also make things safe, I think, for people to, to adopt and set expectations correctly and give us the room to uh, refine something before labeling it uh, as ready to go. Um, there was a third one I can't remember, but uh, but really separating those two out is, is key, in my opinion. Thanks, Brian. So I, I, I tend to strongly agree with the consistency of, of labeling. I think that that will be important. And, you know, I don't know if we need to have, well, I, I suppose we can, we, can, we can think about, you know, setting specific criteria for that labeling. That might make sense. But um, I, think it, I think I agree, you know, very much with the, the points you're making on, you know, the, the sort of the the type of community that the incubation process has enabled in Apache, and that's actually it's been replicated elsewhere. So it's, I think it's it's pretty successful. And that ongoing reporting is, I think, speaks to the concerns about what happens if a project launches and then loses momentum. Um, Apache has been known to discontinue projects uh, because mm. they've lost that momentum. And uh, that kind of mortal fear is actually somewhat useful. I mean, it's a, it's a sign that, you know, because uh, it certainly is a big problem if there's a security hold noticed in something critical and no one's around to know how to push a, an update to it, right? Um, so, so, yeah, that's, that regular communication back and forth is, I mean, it'll be second nature on a project when we start, you know, because uh, there's only two right now and there could be more soon. But, uh, um, uh, but that, that heartbeat is kind of essential, I think. So how do we get to the sort of the next step with the incubation exit criteria, folk? Um, 
just just it's a question from Richard here. Just um, so this, this this conversation has been really helpful because um, it's, it's great to hear experience from people who, who've done this and, and from other projects. And my my initial thought, I looked at the the draft document for the first time just now, and uh, my comment was um, areas where it's trying to be prescriptive about you know certain metrics is probably the wrong way to go. And uh, this discussion, I think, is is, is making the same point. Um, if, I, if I heard Brian correctly, you're saying that you know, there's there's a process that works pretty well in in Apache. Is is there the equivalent? I mean, maybe the answer is yes. It's, maybe I should know this. But is there an equivalent document that we can just use as uh, at least review as a potential um, as input to the current one, or as or as a starting point? I, do we, to what extent do we actually need to reinvent anything here? I'd encourage um, all of us to go. Uh, I'll send the link around uh, if Chris hadn't sent it before. I think I might have seen it on the TSC list, but uh, if not, I will, I will definitely send it around. Um, uh, and we should use it as a starting point. Um, it is high maintenance in some ways because <laughs> it was it's it's been refined, and now the ASF has 300 different projects, and um, and their principle is their main board, their their version of the governing board, reviews reports once a quarter, which turns into three-hour board meetings every month. Um, so it, uh, it may be high touch, but maybe high touch is what we want right now. Um, but I'd use it as inspiration and a starting point and a base for conversation about what we want um, without treating it as gospel. Uh, it just is is pretty well vetted, pretty well tested. Um, and, uh, and, I'll, and I'll take it as an action, I'm certainly, to look at the uh, 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 release criteria as a, uh, in, in the light of that, uh, uh, in, you know, with that, with that in mind, um, but it may be worth asking: Is there a second document we may want to come up with that's parallel uh, to that that talks about, you know, the release taxonomy that we would hope to standardize across projects? So, in in, in light of that, I think you know the, the the fabric team was hoping to be able to at least cut a release. Now we don't have to call it anything. We can just sort of, you know, sort of play play it down a little bit, but. Um, I do think that, you know, as part, I think, you know, one of the things that we have, you know, for, for all of these projects is that I think, you know, we would like to demonstrate that, in fact, you can do this as a team, you know, as a, as a community, um, you know, to produce a release that's got all the right bits and pieces and has, uh, you know, established a process that can be followed and so forth. Um, but if we're, I mean, are, are we going to wait until, Till we see some release criteria before we can do that, or would it be safe to come out with something and just call it, you know, alpha or something? So, what would set expectations right? Um, and we can. I, I don't. I. I wouldn't want to hold up a release while we're working on taxonomy, but at the same time, taxonomy shouldn't take a long time to do. Um, you know, I I worry even alpha suggests that uh, a certain degree of um, maturity, <laughs> uh, but I think either yeah. alpha or developer preview um, might might set expectations correctly. Okay. All right. What what might be also useful when you make a release is to highlight those areas that will be a key focus. Uh, you know, beyond that, um, you know, if performance, for example, is a key concern, you know, to to in the in the release announcement, be clear about that. And uh, um, and focus people's attention on that. Yeah, and I also want to sort of emphasize a point that you know, for for some projects, you know, and I'll just sort of you know, they have a release process, and when they cut a release, it's a big deal, right? Um, and then there are others that are a little bit more agile, and they're cutting releases all the time, but they're, it's not a big deal, right? Docker, Cloud Foundry, um, you know, Kubernetes. A lot of these projects have you know, whether they're dot releases or whatever they want to call them. And it's really just, here's, you know, a stable version, right? And it's really not saying anything much more than that, right? And then, you know, we, uh, you know a few times a year, we'll have a... Uh... Somebody go on mute, please. Thanks. Um, uh, you know, maybe a couple of times or three, four times a year, they might have a formal release that's got some hoopla associated with it and some messaging and labeling and so forth beyond just here's another stable release. I'm assuming or I would hope that we would be able to accommodate something like that because I do think it's very important that we have uh, that we adopt a, a process where you know the code is constantly changing but the people are able to pick up you know a stable version and, and really kick the crap out of it and give us solid feedback and so forth. So 
So I would I would encourage when we think about the taxonomy to be thinking about um, you know each of those stages perhaps having a progressively higher tier required of kind of community approval before it's released. Where early on, it might be something such as you know if three people give it a give a given release image um, a thumbs up you know a plus one and no one gives it a veto then it can go out i think uh and 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 who counts in that you know is is right now perhaps pretty loose you know could it be anyone anywhere giving a veto i'd say let's try it let's try uh empowering folks in the community um and we can correct for that uh if we find it's too broad um and then as you get closer to a say a proper beta release or a, uh, something you would call production then you could have it uh, a higher higher threshold of positive votes uh, and people willing to, you know, so you're essentially asking people to put their names next to, uh, as personal developers next to the release, right? Um, I, I attest to the quality of this as it hits this, this threshold, this criteria. And the more diverse that committer base can be, the better, um, even early on, even early on. Any other thoughts? Um, so, I guess, well, I think it's, it's probably worthwhile then that we sort of take yet another stab at going through the exit criteria and bringing it back forward. Um, it would probably help if people could also just weigh in either in the comments um, uh, or via email so that we can continue this discussion and not have to have it be punctuated by weekly calls. Um, because I do think it's important that we uh, make these decisions because then as you know we've just been discussing we probably have to take it to you know discuss release criteria and so forth as um, a separate uh, exercise and I wouldn't want to have all these loose threads all at once so um, I know if you wouldn't mind sort of taking you know all of this into consideration and taking you know the pass at, at the exit criteria uh, and then send it out to the list. Yeah, yeah, sure. But you, you, to be honest, it's a bit difficult because I feel like you know we don't have a clear alignment as to what the nature of the you know exit criteria should be. I mean, when I look at the link I posted it, Mike Dolan had posted it as a comment to the document. Uh, the the exit criteria for the incubation at Apache, it's more. It's actually better. You know, it's better uh, developed than what we have for sure. But uh, it's it's in the same vein, in my opinion. It kind of gives you some general idea of you know what constitutes a mature project or, or what you know uh, qualify as mature. And and it's quite different from other things that people have talked about. It doesn't actually talk about releases or the actual state of the product per se. And so I just would like to make sure that. You know, we 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 have an agreement on okay. This is the kind of things we're going to focus on when we talk about exit criteria for the incubation. Because if we don't agree on the scope, then it makes it very hard to make progress. Mm -hmm. And you know, another aspect that I wanted to bring up is the um, in uh, Jeremy's table. I noticed that there is a, a stress on the change control and it proposes, for instance, that a project in maturation cannot basically have any drastic changes unless it goes through a whole incubation again. I mean, this is beyond my expectation. I don't know if other people have opinions on that. But, no, um, I think that's a function, again, of the cadence of releases that, um, you know, that is expected, I think, that projects would continue to evolve and improve and uh, or you know just be at a point where they're squashing bugs um, <clears throat> but that's not uh, an incubation function that again I think incubation is a function of the team I like Brian's of sort of the reporting requirement that sort of holds people's feet to the fire or you know we you know the project runs the risk of being uh, you know, demoted, as it were, you know, to um, ACK or archive or whatever, um, you know, create uh, their classification. In Apache, think of in, in Apache, it's called the attic. <laughs> yeah. um, 
and yeah, basically so put into on Foundry as well. Right? Yeah. Or but it's okay. I mean, it's furniture it's, by the side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's a it's a healthy part of of yeah. these communities, and and you know, I, I, I again, it's um, um, yeah, it's it's some, something we we're developing a community. You know, code code is a natural byproduct of a healthy community, and um, that's our number one focus should be how do we get the healthiest developer community going you need code to act as kind of the honey for the for the um or, or the the flowers for the bees to gather around <laughs> but we're building a hive right uh and uh um i don't know i could easily get my metaphors right uh um the, the uh um the the point is yeah we'll I think we can manage this. I think we can take our inspiration from from Apache and others. I don't know. I've, I uh, owe you and the rest kind of uh, more thorough participation in the exit criteria drafting process. So let me take it as an action item this weekend to spend some more time, and uh, maybe maybe uh, I could put a first draft together of what a release uh, release taxonomy might look like um, in parallel to that. Uh, exit criteria from graduation so, so we can pull over anything that is product specific about what the product is expected to do um, into that separate document. Does that make sense? I, I think so. I, th I think to Ar Arnold's point about the scope, I think if you made a real clean hard separation between the, com the community versus the product, I think that yeah. could work well. Okay. All right, and then uh, I'm happy to continue working on the list with that in mind. And so, you know, focusing more on, an, on the exit criteria from the project point of view, and which will be more in line with what we see there on the Apache page. And so, you know, uh, my expectation will be that we focus the list on this for now for the exit criteria of the incubation. And then the other dimension that people have brought up will be addressed elsewhere, including the release, you know, uh, taxonomy. If everybody is agreement, agreeing with that plan, I'm happy to continue. Maybe a consensus of the TSC voting members. Um, yeah, we'll have to do it. Kind of a round robin. Right, we'll, we'll, have to do <laughs> we'll use PBFT for this. <laughs> <laughs> All That's right. not funny. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Mick, if we use proof of elapsed time, we'll never get it done. <laughs> yeah, because we can all go back and get our coffee and then come back, and whoever gets back first wins, right? <clears throat> <laughs> Eventually, we'll just make decisions like this on a blockchain, and it'll be so easy. Yeah. Okay. I think we beat that one to death. Um, can we talk, uh, Dan? You want to give an update on uh, the Sawtooth Lake Hackathon, and then I don't know if Sheehan is on. Uh, maybe he could give an update and some thoughts from his perspective. Yeah, so we uh, we were able to kick things off yesterday morning as planned, and I think we had good participation in the first kickoff meeting. Uh, we had uh, uh, Ben talk about a few project ideas on the fabric uh, that were mostly quality oriented, and then we had Sean Amundsen, who's one of the Sawtooth maintainers. Uh, present a couple project ideas around transaction families. Um, the the one that the, the community picked up on the Sawtooth side to run with is a battleship project. So we've been having fun with that. The idea between uh, the idea around all of these uh, arcade games over on the Sawtooth side is that uh, it gives the system uh, it gives you a way to exercise the system in the same way that you would with other sorts of real-world transactions, be they financial or, or other. Um, so we can exercise requirements like confidentiality. Uh, this, this battleship one gives uh, a long-running set of transactions. So uh, we made good progress with that. We had some uh, active contributors uh, working in... Uh, Maybe awkward times. Uh, have a, a chap out in uh, uh, Brussels, and uh, somebody else working through lunch in Virginia, and so uh, good all around first day. And uh, we'll be picking stuff up after this conversation uh, later this morning. 
we've got two Slack channels active, one on the, the Fabric Hackathon, one on the Sawtooth Hackathon. And then the, uh, the other tool that seems to be common amongst them is uh, the document that uh, Todd created. There's a Google Doc out there. And that has the definitions for the, the projects that were proposed. And uh, my team is, is continuing to evolve that document as we, we flesh out the, the battleship game that's being developed. Uh, for those who can't participate live in uh, this virtual hackathon, um, put a uh, link out in the, the chat there. The, the work that's the, the uh, transaction family stuff is uh, based on a new tutorial that we've released on the Sawtooth code base. So the, the link to the documentation is there. And so you can work through your own game if that's of interest to you independently. Otherwise, uh, like I said, we'll be reconvening after this meeting and uh, we can help facilitate connections with, with any of the projects between uh, Fabric and Hyperledger, or Fabric and Sawtooth, rather. Cool. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> Sheehan or Ben, one of you guys on that might want to give a brief update on the Fabric? Yeah, sure. We've uh, got a bunch of issues out there that are tagged as help wanted, um, and we've had a bunch of people kind of looking at those and picking up ones that look interesting and fixing them. Um, and then on top of that, uh, a couple of us have been looking at the Go Report card. Um, you can see that if you just go to the main page of the Fabric project and click the, uh, there's a badge that says Go Report. Um, and we've been trying to clean up those remaining errors um, and then get some of that um, functionality checking in our build process. Um, I think Dan did a good job of covering where to um, contact us in the Slack channels if you want to participate. Great, thanks. Anything, you know, Dan or Sheehan or anybody else who's been participating want to Weigh in, is there anything we could be doing more, less, better, worse? Feedback is always useful in these things. Well, I think we had very little planning going into it, and I think the fact that, that we're making good strides without that is, is a good sign. Um, we're always open to new collaboration tools. The, the, uh, the Battleship stuff has been being worked out mostly over uh, Google Hangouts and the Google yep. Doc. Uh, I haven't really had a chance to try some of the other tools that uh, Christopher Allen had suggested, but uh, uh, interested in feedback or, or thoughts for, for other ways to um, get you know multiple hands into the, the same code while their eyes are on it. Thanks, Dan. So just as a, as a general question, you know, and this is just day one, but I'd like to come back to this on Friday when we have the, the kind of wrap-ups. But um, are the virtual hackathons as effective um, as the face-to-face? -face? Um, and <clears throat> and I understand the cost and time issues, cost and time trade-offs and other things like that. But um, I'm really curious if, if this is a model that we can use consistently going forward. Uh, my experience has been that I, I think they're not quite as effective as the face-to-face, -face. Um, but but I think in the future, yeah, maybe we could explore some additional tools. Um, you know, if we if we had a virtual hackathon where you know we had a couple rooms full of people in different areas, and maybe we tried some kind of uh, you know video conferencing between those rooms, uh, I wonder if that's something that would help. Hey, did, hey uh, this is Morali from DDCC. I think more than the tools, right, I think it's the fact that we're still in the office uh, makes it hard for us to, you know, take fully part in this virtual hackathon. We're still tied to the office. Yeah, I don't know if there's an opportunity to kind of block out time for people so that, you know, it's like you're traveling even if you're still um, right. physically in your normal place. That's a good point. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll offer maybe a um, complimentary viewpoint that 
this has been a little bit more productive from from my perspective in that we've we've got participants from some geographically diverse areas that I don't know if we would have gotten if we had required a, a single physical location. Um, and I think that whenever we're on even conference calls like this, if you've got a collection of people that are in a room and then you've got a few people who aren't in that room, there's such a big divide between how those people communicate that it's, it's not as effective. But if everybody's on the same playing field, that everybody's remote and everybody is, is collaborating through whatever the remote tool is, then that communication is is smoothed out and evened out, and I think everybody's on the same playing field. Okay. Yeah, I mean, my my, my personal take is that, um, you know, it may take us time to sort of you know, to get to the point where the virtual is, is as effective as a face-to-face. -face. I think the thing that the face-to-face -face does is, you know, brings people together. They're out of their typical, you know, distraction environment of the regular day job. And, you know, where when people are sitting, you know, in their day job, they're, they're going to be distracted all day. And so I, I'm not sure how much people are actually sort of devoting to this, it's hard to tell. Um, you know, I think we'll, we'll, we'll see over time, but, um, you know, the nice thing about a face-to-face is it brings people together. Uh, you can also do more than just, you know, sort of coding together or, you know, collaborating, meeting, discussing architectures and so forth, because it also gives you an opportunity to, um, to socialize. And I think that that's actually, a, I mean, open source is a social thing. Right, I mean, it, it, that's it, it, it. You know, at the end of the day, that's really what it's about, and um, and so it's an important function that we get to, you know, know each other better, um, and uh, and I think the face to face is very effective at that. Whereas I think the virtual hackathon may get us, you know, to a point where we can have people online and so forth, but um, where um, uh, you know, I think getting people physically together, I think, has an additional. Uh, an, in, an additional value that the virtual hackathon simply can't achieve. But again, you know, being able to pull, you know, Google Hangouts, it's 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 an improvement over just Slack. It's an improvement over just email, but um, it, it's not the same as being there, as they say. <clears throat> yeah, I like the idea of mixing it up and and uh, maybe continuing to alternate between virtual and physical. Yeah. It's, a, it's inclusive in the sense of, you know, there's people that just won't be able to travel, um, right. people that aren't necessarily being compensated to work on, on this that, you know, aren't going to be able to reimburse travel. So, uh, however we can include the most people and, and, and keep things, um, uh, keep the mix going is, I think, helpful. Mm -hmm. All right. And for what it's worth, whenever we have these meetings, Chris, I, I'm drinking to be social. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> I'm with you there. Um, okay. Uh, so next up, I think was, was Greg. I think I think we've beaten the, the hackathon to death. To death. Um, and uh, I apologize, but I have to leave, and I'm going to leave my vote with Todd and say I I approve. Uh, but Greg has a, uh, a, a a project proposal that he'd like to present on something called Chain Tool. And um, so I have to pack up and leave my room. I will try to dial back in, but I, I will have to sort of um, be off the WebEx for, for, for a bit. Thank you, Chris. Uh, could someone give me presenter status if that's possible? Thank you. So. Uh, I'm not sure which screen is coming through. What do you guys see right now? A picture of my daughter or a web browser? <laughs> I have two monitors. I can see your browser, Greg. Okay, perfect. All right, so uh, I'm not sure if everyone has had a chance to review the proposal, but um, so what I have here is a tool that I've been working on for the last few months. Um, the proposal could be summarized as just uh, I'm proposing to bring the repository of this code into the tree of Fabric. Um, the support for the tool is actually already in Fabric. 
Um, but let's talk a little bit about what the tool does. I, I wanted to just give a kind of brief overview and a quick demo if, if anyone was interested. Um, but in, in summary, you could think of Chain Tool as a kind of a compiler and build tool. Um, what the pain point for me when I first started working, this was back before it was even a Hyperledger project when it was over blockchain, was the lack of a formal schema definition on chain code and, and, and the life cycle, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the lifetime management of that interface. So if there's changes to the ABI and, and you know, if a long running application changes its ABI, uh, how do clients adapt and things like that. So <clears throat> the pain point, the primary pain point for me was to uh, come up with a more uh, formal definition of the interface, make it language neutral and, and build in, um, you know, backwards and forwards compatibility features that you would expect to have for a long running interface. Um, but in addition to that, I also tackled some other things that I saw um, I thought could use some more formal definitions such as, you know, how, how chain code is packaged up and deployed. Um, you know, right, the canonic, the, at the time I wrote this, the only support for chain code was for Golang and there wasn't a real formal packaging, it was kind of an ad hoc thing. So I, I tried to come up with a language neutral packaging uh, mechanism uh, as part of this and the tool helps to do that. So the ba the, the in summary, the two basic uh, areas it's tackling are language neutral definition of the interface with you know with schema management back and forth compatibility and language neutral packaging of chain code for deployment um, in various languages. Now that being said, um, the mechanism to, to describe both those things is number one, there's a definition for a um, uh, an interface definition language to use to describe those interfaces, and there's also a the concept of a platform. Uh, with the idea that uh, a, a project can declare the, the chain code platform it's targeting and the tool will help to build the um, the environment and resources you need for that particular platform. Today we still only support Golang, but the tool could be extended to support um, other platforms as well, such as Java or, or whatever else people will be interested in. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, the, the, the summary of the tool, um, it has eight subcommands. There's uh, so on the on the kind of like on the build side, there's build clean and package, which is what I think developers would primarily be using. Um, it works very much like um, you know you might see in other tools like Maven or whatever or Lenengine, where you can say uh, you know build or clean the project. The idea is really that as a developer, the normal workflow would look something like this, where you have this iterative cycle where you're editing your code and you're using chain code build to test the, 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 the code compiles and doesn't have warnings and, and et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes time to deploy it, you actually use chain code package, which, the, which emits a uh, packaged up version of your code that you can deploy to the fabric. So the idea is that the build code, the build uh, routine is primarily there to give the developer some fidelity with the same process that the back end will use when, it, when the code is compiled for the, in, within the peer network. Um, it also has benefits as a secondary uh, feature to help with like dev mode. So if you want to build the binary and launch it in dev mode, you can use the build tool directly for that as well. Um, but anyway, normal workflow is you iteratively go through build until you're happy and then you package and send it out. So what I wanted to do now is um, give a quick demo of that actually happening in action. Um, so what I have here is a, um, a I took a port of the example 2 from the Hyperledger Fabric uh, code base and I ported it to the chain code, I'm sorry, the chain tool environment. Um, so what that means is essentially I was um, taking the, the interface that was presented uh, in the chain code example 2 and, and describing it in terms of this language neutral interface for chain tool. Uh, and what that means is when, you, when we set up any given project, um, the, the code here, source chain code, um, source chain code area holds your project, the, the, the code for your project. There's two extra pieces of metadata that you attach to your project. One would be uh, a YAML file that describes the chain code uh, project, and the other would be the declaration of the interfaces that the, the, the project exports. Or, or consumed, right? Because you can also consume other other chain codes interfaces. But if we look at chain code YAML, for instance, um, we can see here that it it does some basic things like declare the name and version of this particular uh, project. But it also declares a platform um, dependency. So we're saying this particular chain code is built against the Golang platform version one. Um, now, right now, 
the version one has no real specific meaning. It, I've, what I intend is that if this, if this were to be accepted, we could have the same kind of notion that you might have with, like, say, Java 1.7 versus 1.8. You know, there's, it would mean specific things with respect to the ABI that that chain code could expect to be executed under. Um, so that might mean minimally, um, you know, a specific version of the shim or any other libraries that we want to include uh, that would be helpful for a um, chain code app. So it can say, I'm compatible with version one, and the environment, it, when it's deployed to the network, it, the network will spin up an environment that uh, meets that criteria. Um, the last part of it is the um, code can declare what's called provided or consumed interfaces. So a chain code can provide exported interfaces for people to call into it, and it can also consume interfaces from other chain code if you want to do chain code to chain code invokes. Uh, but the idea is that you could declare uh, the interfaces that your project uses in both the provides and consumes capacity here. And then the last part of it would be, um, you know, actually putting in these what we call CCI files or chain code interface files um, to describe those interfaces. So um, just briefly here, if we look at um, the interface for this example, this particular uh, application has uh, two transactions and in one query. So this is a, uh, it's an RPC like IDL. Um, it's very closely modeled against protobufs if you're familiar. So the message definitions up here, which constitute the parameters that we pass, uh, you know, in and get a result out of, are modeled very closely to protobuf messages. The only thing that's really different here from protobuf is the the structure of the um, the transactions versus queries. Um, number one, we split them out so that we separate transactions from queries so that we can route them properly within the environment. And the other aspect is that I really uh, didn't like that the the gRPC mechanism kind of got rid of the, the concept of a tag or index because I, I think that's one of the, uh, the functions that allows you to have better forward and backwards compatibility over time, you know, to, to have that semantic decoupling from the name of the function to, to its index. So I tried to retain those two, you know, I want that separation between transaction and queries, I want to retain the tags, but otherwise it's very much protobuf looking, uh, like if you're familiar. Uh, but anyway, so once, once your project is set up with that structure, you know, so you have your code, you have your YAML, you have your interfaces, um, we can then use the chain tool itself to do interesting things. So if we run without any options, um, we'll get that, that list of help for the subcommands. And any any given subcommand you can run with dash dash help will give you more info. But in this case, what I'm going to do is um, to start with, a, I'll just say chain, uh, chain to build. And it's going to take that YAML, um, take the code, take the interfaces, and compile it all together into a binary. So this would be a representation of, you know, the development process, the iterative process is making sure that my code actually compiles and has no warrants. Um, <clears throat> now when this completes in a moment, I can say, okay, I'm happy with that. It didn't have any errors, so I'm going to take a turn around and, oh, it's still going, sorry. So you can see actually in the background, um, what's happening is the tool is, um, actually using the protobuf compiler, so I, I, I process, I parse the CCI files and actually turn them under the, underneath the hood into a protobuf file and I then compile them. In this case, since we're targeting um, uh, Golang, it's, it's generating pb.go output for, from that. And then I'm invoking go get and go build on the code, and, but I'm synthesizing things like the go path. Um, so what's kind of interesting here is that the, uh, you know, because a, a given project is going to depend on uh, different things, like it's going to depend on any of the libraries that the project itself directly imports, um, as well as things that might already be in your Go path, like the shim code, for instance. Um, there's various Go paths that we actually build dynamically um, to, to assist with that. So when a project is built, um, you can see over here, uh, we just created this build directory. So this build directory is created by the tool as it's building, and we actually synthesize a few different Go paths. So one is the Go path for your project itself, which makes sense. Another is it inherits the Go path that you had set in the environment. But there's two additional ones. So one is one is that we have this notion of um, build depths. So that's where I, I resolve direct and transitive dependencies using go get, and I stick them into your build area. And the other is that we're actually synthesizing code, um, in this case, Golang code, since it's a Golang project, 
which I'll get into in a minute. But all of these things together get synthesized into one go path by the tool of this building so that it, it, it builds cohesively. Um, anyway, so the the project is built. I could say at this point, all right, I'm happy with it and I'm ready to deploy. So the normal workflow would be someone takes chain tool and says package. And that will generate what's called a car file, which is supposed to evoke, uh, you know, the, the same kind of notion of like a jar file. It's, a, it's an archive, a chain code archive. So we take all the code and the metadata associated with your project um, and we package it up. So in this case, you can see the code and the inner CCI files and the YAML are packaged together. Um, it's very much analogous to a tarball or anything else, but there's some there's a, some additional chain code specific things in here, such as um, you know we're going to compute the SHA one of each individual file, and we're going to compute the SHA three, which actually I don't know what the formal hashing mechanism will be for chain code, so it could be SHA three, SHA two, whatever we can change that. But right now the demo is using SHA three, so I give it I get an overall hash for the chain code project itself. The files are all compressed and individually hashed, so I can you know get an idea of the specific versions, including the package and uh, it's now written to this um, car file ready to be deployed. So from there I can then take the standard uh, fabric uh, peer client and upload this car into the fabric and it would compile it or I could do other things like I can I can do chain code uh, chain tool ls if I wanted to see what it's going to run the same thing we just saw but um, if I had a car file I want to see what's in it I can do that. I can do unpack and all of the other kinds of things you would expect. But um, normally you would say, okay, I built it, now I'm going to package it, now I'm going to deploy it. So for the dev purposes of demo, it's actually a little bit easier just to use dev mode. So rather than deploy the car file, I'm just going to spin up the binary that I already built uh, in dev mode. So I'm going to start up here, is dev mode here. I'm going to, um, I'm going to launch Oh, one thing I should show is when I when I did the build, it emitted a um, binary in build bin. Right, so here's here's the binary that was the result of me running chain tool, chain tool build. So what I'm going to do now is uh, run that in the dev mode fashion. So I'm going to give it the name mycc. There's the peer address. There's the binary. So I launched that. <laughs> it's now it's now running in registered in dev mode, and it's just waiting for a deploy uh, to complete it. So down here, I have a client that I've written um, against this interface. Let's see, deploy. So I'm going to deploy uh, against the chain code, the registered chain code, my CC operation deploy, and I'm going to give it some uh, initial parameters. Now the initial parameters I didn't get into are defined by this app init interface. So this this init um, message defines what our constructor will accept. So that's exactly what I'm filling in here. I'm saying uh, we have party A with a named A value 100. This is an asset management application, by the way, if you're not familiar with example two. So what I'm doing here is I'm establishing two um, accounts with a balance, an initial balance and tokens of 100 each. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and deploy this. And you can see the um, the peer recognized the deploy and the chain code saw some activity there, and, and we now have a status of OK. So our chain code is now deployed with the accounts A and B with a value of 100 apiece. And now is I'm going to um, do a couple different transactions. So I'm going to invoke this uh, check balance query uh, for both accounts. So let's see here. All right, so I'm going to check balance for the entity A. And I can see here I got back a value of 100, which is expected. I'll do the same thing for B. I got a balance of 100. We can see the activity going on in the back end. Uh, and now I'll invoke the uh, make payment. So I'm going to send 10 tokens from A to B. So Source party A, sort desktop party B, uh, amount 10. I'll execute that. Um, we got back a status OK, so it worked. And if I now do subsequent check balances between A, we can see they have 90 and B. 
they have 110 as we expect. So nothing exciting there. It's the same exact thing as the uh, example two demo. It just has the, the, the CCI slash chain tool interfaces on it. Um, so we could presumably, uh, oh, one thing I did want to show that's a kind of an additional neat thing here is that there's a notion of a metadata interface. So, so we actually emit a dynamic interface into your code as it's compiling that um, exports metadata. Um, right now, I don't really put a whole heck of a lot in there, but we can actually query it. So um, I can take um, any given um, chain code instance, and I can run um, chain tool inspect, and I give it the name of the instance, in this case, my, my CC. And when I run it, it actually goes out through the REST interface um, queries the chain code and comes back with information about that package. So we can see here that uh, we have the example two application version 1.0.1 snapshot. It's running on Golang 1.6. The chain tool that built it was 0.8 snapshot, blah, blah, blah. Um, we can add whatever facts we would like to, to, to see surface there um, very easily. Um, it also, it, it, it tells us the exposed interfaces. So this is saying this, this particular application exposes these interfaces. And I can optionally um, say dash i foo to download those interfaces into a directory foo. Um, and now if I look in foo, oops, I can see I have those files, right? So I can say foo or CCI. So now if I wanted to develop a client or a consumed interface in a different piece of chain code um, that do, wants to do chain code, the chain code invokes, I now have the interface and I can, I can incorporate that into my uh, workflow. So that is kind of the summary of, of uh, what the tool does. Um, it's written in Clojure, um, which is a language that I personally really like to code in and, it, and it's well suited to developing compilers, which is essentially what this is. Um, I don't know if anyone has any comments about the code itself or the, the function of the tool or, or anything like that, so I'll just open it up. This is Brian. Do you see this as a contribution particularly to Fabric, or do you see this as potentially something that could be a, a, a standalone community and product uh, underneath underneath Hyperledger, like something related to Fabric, clearly related to chain code, but potentially for use uh, if chain code is perhaps even used in other other circumstances as well? I think, so I, I coded it with what became Hyperledger Fabric in mind, and, so, and there's definitely some opinions in there about what, you know, for instance, the, the code that I generate is compatible with the, the, fab, the Fabric shim. Um, that being said, I'm sure, you know, with some refactoring it could be made more generic. Um, you know, it is, after all, taking in an input schema and, an out, and has an output schema, and it, it's translating between the two. So we could certainly make it translate to something else. Uh, it would take a little bit of work to get there. You know, it, there, there are some, there are some uh, um, you, you know, ch fabric specifics in there today that we would have to tease out. Okay, and, and it's partly a technical question. It's partly also a community development question too. Like, uh, you know, to support this well probably means building, you know, a a, 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 a proper community focused on it um, of, uh, of lots of others. So, yeah. So, uh, um, I'll I'll kind of second what Brian's saying with this is that um, uh, you know part of part of me would say if this is if this is fabric specific. Um, First, let me say this looks really cool. <clears throat> so, um, but if it's fabric specific, you know, do we need a separate project uh, for it? Um, that being said, um, you know, I can really imagine how this could be generalized into something that that describes, um, uh, you know, uh, schema transformations, messages, um, transaction interfaces, um, and the concept of this tool. Um, would be something to be useful regardless of what the underlying fabric uh, or what the underlying protocols or mechanisms would be for it. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, uh, I guess on one, on one hand, I'm, you know, all in favor of improving anything, but this looks like something that could generalize very nicely. Yeah, I, th I think that's totally accurate. I mean, I, I'd be open to that too. You know, I, I, I didn't uh, paint myself into the fabric corner to, to, because I didn't think it would work anywhere else. It's just that was where the focus was. I, I, I can see that being a general um, 
mechanism to, to describe an interface and, and emit code. Uh, we would just have to think about a couple of the uh, the way the codes emitted today. I think. Yep. So this this is Chris. I'm I'm partly back on the car though. Um, yeah. No. This sounds really cool, and I I like the idea of potentially having this be a much more general uh, and generalized uh, solution for dealing with deploying and packaging up a smart contract. Um, and, and so, you know, to that end, Mick, I mean, and, and others, would, would, would there be interest in collaborating with Greg on, you know, taking it out of the corner that it's in and, and helping to make it more generalizable and, and useful in the context of whether it's Soft Tooth Lake or, for that matter, anything else. I mean, I think I think that's you know the important sort of next question that we have to ask ourselves is who's willing to sort of to to collaborate with Greg on on moving this thing forward. Um, I I can certainly do a little bit more um, digging into the the description. The only thing I had before was the was the project proposal page, um, but uh, taking a look at the code and just seeing I I know that. In Sawtooth right now, we have um, a transaction specification file, but it's really documentation. Um, uh, and what I really like about this is that you're taking sort of that that abstraction and making it um, uh, it's it's more than a specification. It it's really a prescriptive description of uh, what the behavior should be and the interfaces to it. And and it, I mean. We've talked a lot about you know what level can we start thinking about kind of standards and interoperability, um, and this looks like a really nice starting place for it. Yeah, no, I I, I agree, Mick, and and so I'm glad to hear you say that. Just out of curiosity, Greg, and I missed the the first sort of half of I guess of your your presentation. Is the API definition stuff is that based on Swagger or is that Help me understand well, so what you're using. If I understand what you're asking, um, so the, the, the CCI, I, I assume you're asking about the CCI interface that ends up defining the, the interface into the chain code? Yeah. So, right. so it actually isn't based on Swagger. It, it, it's, it's probably best described as protobuf based, um, but today it, it, it tunnels through the existing um, fabric interface. So today when you have a call into the fabric, you just specify a function in an array of strings for the arguments. And what I do is I have a very specific uh, schema for defining what the function name should be, and then I, I package the payload as the first uh, parameter in the argument string as a base64 encoded protobuf object. So okay. it's, you know, it's, not, it's not a standard, uh, it's kind of a, a merge between the existing Fabric ABI and protobufs. And obviously, there's some flexibility there. I mean, we can, if that was for some reason objectionable, we could do it a different way. That's just the way I, I did it for now. And this is Morali. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing, if I can add, I think this also takes us towards a step towards proper DSLs, uh, domain specific languages. You know, now that we have a mechanism to describe it as a higher level. We could start injecting DSL kind of uh, uh, take DSL kind of approaches to using this kind of tool as well. Yeah, and actually to that point, that was one of the reasons I tried to stick to a reasonably uh, ubiquitous mechanism like Protobus because they do have wide, they do enjoy wide language support, right? So if the, I know the, I, I think it's the DTCC folks are working on Java. Like, there's no reason why. Java could become a platform definition with a chain tool, and it could still express its interface with CCI exactly the way we did it here. It's just the Java side would be interpreting uh, the messages via the protobuf support for Java, and what you know, so on and so forth for any other language that we wanted to implement. If it if it can support protobufs, it could easily consume this. Um, uh, you know, that was part of it. I mean, I know there's there's other ways to skin that particular cat. You could do JSON RPC or you know uh, any number of other serializers out there, but Protobuf is something that was both familiar to me, uh, high, you know, performs very well and is widely available, so I based on it. But there, there's other ways to do it. So 
So, <clears throat> thoughts, should we approve this as a, um, an incubating top-level project that could potentially evolve into something that's generally useful, or should we approve it as a sub-project of Fabric? Possibly with its own repository, so that we could maybe then think about this down the road. I don't know, Mick. You said you wanted to give this a little bit more thought. I'd like to get your sense of where you, what you're thinking. Um, I guess it, in in the current form, it it makes sense as a sub project of Fabric. I think you know, there's there's no way for us to to lift it out as it exists um, and drop it in. Um, uh, I I. And, and and in that context, I'm completely in favor. So it looks like a great idea, and and as a starting point, it allows us to start really exploring some other um, some other ideas on this. Um, uh, regarding the, the you know its applicability, it, I mean, I'm just what I'm doing is looking at this, going, you know, geez, we could use something like this as a as a compiler for transaction families, which would give us both you know client side validation and server side validation components easily to be generated. Um, but I, I'm not sure I would start with with this form of specification. But the concept and the idea of this tool is something that looks really, really useful. Um, and and I say I'm not sure only because I haven't looked at detail to think about it as a multi multi backend um, application. Yeah. It, not that it not that it won't work, but just that I haven't spent enough time looking at it. So the the thinking about it some more because this is the really first time I thought about it so it's kind of off the cuff but you know I I think in terms of the overall support for an arbitrary um, concept as opposed to being specific to Fabric would be fairly easy to do um, so that I already have the notion of a platform definition abstracted out mm -hmm. um, so today I have the notion of like uh, GoLang is is org hyperledger chain code GoLang. But we could certainly change it to be or hyperledger fabric chain code going, and it's pretty much you know room for oh. sawtooth or anything else to slip in a, a, a different one without uh, a, any conflict whatsoever. The only part that's that's really um, you know probably most fabric specific is the inspect tool because I do generate a fabric specific um, a rest call, and that could either be something that we put as a separate tool or 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 we abstract that. It, the concept of inspection out as well as part of the platform abstraction, and then I think it would be relatively straightforward to put anybody else's support in there because the the platform abstraction really so the 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 core of the code if you look at it it the core of the code is really dealing with the um, abstract syntax tree that we get from parsing the YAML file and the CCI files which are not they I don't think off the top of my head would be fabric specific and then the platform takes the AST and spits out in this case what you know my going uh, our going uh, fabric code but if you wrote a different if you wrote a different platform it could generate whatever code it wants to um, so I don't see that as a problem I, I think it could be achieved relatively in a straightforward manner it, obviously there would be some work to define the platform but in terms of you know uh, dealing with the abstraction I think it's straightforward but we, we can we can take that as a offline conversation I mean I, I can uh, talk to Mick offline and show him what the abstraction is and if we still think it makes more sense to just start now as a sub project and then we can always promote it at some future date that's fine too but uh, you know I'll, I'll throw it out there so you get a chance to at least see where it's at That sounds good to me. I agree. All right, well, thank you, everyone. That's all I have. Todd, you want to? Thanks, Todd. You want to take a quick roll and get a sense of the TSC, please? Yep, sure thing. Um, we may have lost one or two, but I believe we still have quorum. Uh, so I'll just walk through the list. Uh, Emmanuel. All right, I think we may have lost Emmanuel. Stan. Hello. Hey, Stan. Hello. Uh, so I, I would agree with Nick that um, so it would be great to include it in the project. But I don't think it's ready to be at a top level, so I would agree to include it as a sub-project of Fabric. 
although I think it may be actually more beneficial if uh, there, you know, there's some abstraction work done to actually figure out how to integrate it with Sawtooth and reintroduce it at, a little bit later as a top-level project. Uh, Tomas? I agree to include it fabric. Okay. Stefan? Agree to include it fabric and then move on afterwards. Okay. Parda? Um, yeah, I also agree. It's a really fantastic tool. I think we definitely need this one. Okay. Part? Yep, I agree with what, uh, what everybody else is saying. Oshima-san? Yeah, I agree. All right. Uh, Chris? Yeah, I agree um, as a sub-project of Fabric, but I think I'd make the recommendation that it have its own repository to make it easier to tease apart if we do decide. And if there's interest from a community in, in sort of turning this into something uh, more, uh, more purposeful, more broadly purposeful. So, um, I would say yes as a sub-project, but, you know, we, we should put it in a separate repository. All right. Mick? Uh, I'm in agreement. All right. Dave? Yes, I'm in agreement. All right. And then Richard uh, already dropped. So that is uh, nine yes, and then uh, two are not here. So that, that passes unanimously from those on the call. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. So I apologize, Thanks, but I think we're, we're, we're beyond time. Um, and uh, But this was a, a very good call. I'd like to thank everybody for um, their participation, and um, we'll talk to you all next week. Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye.